What's up guys, it's Griffin and welcome back to my channel. For today's video, I am going to be covering another true crime case. This video in particular is very scary to me because I live near this area and anything that happens near me generally freaks me out a little bit more because this is where I am around pretty much all the time. So without further ado, let's get into Matthew Weaver's case. Matthew Weaver is a 24 year old who grew up in Simi Valley with his stepmother Brooke who raised him since he was a toddler. Brooke and Matthew's father, Matthew Weaver Sr., broke up and Brooke ended up staying very close to Matthew Weaver Jr. He was close to his brother who was 17 and his sisters who were 14 and 24, who definitely say it that he just wouldn't up and disappear like this. He had just moved out to his own apartment in Granada Hills and with the new apartment came some new friends. James Weaver, his uncle, said that he was very charismatic and he had an amazing, wonderful, positive attitude, but he worries that he had fallen in with the wrong group before his disappearance. I know when I first moved out, I wasn't necessarily friends with the most amazing people and with time and with moving into new areas, you meet the right people. I guess you kind of just have to live and learn and realize who is a good friend and who isn't as time passes. So I'm pretty sure he was probably in the process of doing that as he had just recently moved. The apartment was closer to his job where he worked as a lineman for a telephone pole construction company. When Brooke last saw him in the beginning of August, August, he had mentioned that he had broken up with his longtime girlfriend. Like I said, he seemed to be making new friends, but Brooke wasn't the biggest fan of them. I can't really figure out who Matthew worked for. Some reports say that he worked for his father, while other reports say that he worked for a friend of his father's. Either way, on Thursday, August 9th, he went to go pick up his paycheck, and that ended up being $500 cash. His father did see him that day, although it's unverified whether or not he saw him at work or what the situation was where he did see him. But Nonetheless, Matthew told his father that he was going to hang out with one of his newer female friends. He then drove to go pick up this girl in Chatsworth and they partied for the next few hours and he dropped her off at 5 a.m. At 5.45 to 6.24 a.m., Matthew's car drives around Saddle Peak Road and Skirin Road. This is the area where he would usually go to clear his head according to family, but he wasn't known to be a hiker, so it's not entirely known what he was doing here at this time. Sometime in between 6.24 to 6.57, a picture was posted on Matthew's Snapchat story from Stunt Road and Saddle Peak Road parking lot of his view from his car. Somewhere around 7 a.m., Matthew entered the white gate suspiciously left open at Rosa's Overlook, when it normally remains locked and typically should only be accessible by first responders and law enforcement officials. This path was cement at first, but it turned into a dirt trail that was made for hiking, and authorities had permission to drive up it, but no one else really did. Since his disappearance, they have replaced the lock on the gate because they believe the keys either fell into the wrong hands or that the gate was left open because of construction, but they wanted it to be a little bit safer. At 7.15 a.m., security cameras capture his vehicle riding on the Topanga Tower motorway towards Rosa's Overlook. And the GPS on his phone proves that his phone was in his vehicle at the time of this happening. By 7.28 a.m., Matthew's car reached the end of this overlook and no one heard from him for at least four and a half hours. At around 11.30 a.m., he tried calling the girl that he had partied with the night before, but she was at work and she had texted him saying, hey, I'm at work, but what's up? He then sent her text that said, like some crazy is going on shit going on. I just want to talk while I have the chance. And she said, are you okay? And she got no response from him. So a couple hours later, she texted him again, asking if he was okay. And again, got no response. None of this is making sense because he was at this overlook for six and a half hours and his car stayed in that exact spot and didn't move. So what was he doing there for six and a half hours until he eventually tried calling the girl from the night before? Just after midnight on August 11th, near where the surveillance footage picked up, Matthew's car, hikers reported hearing two people, a male and a female, yelling and screaming for help and specifically saying somebody has a gun. I can't confirm that statement in particular, but I did see that in a couple places, so I wanted to throw that in there. During a press release, LAPD said four people found his car and called 911 immediately. Two of these people were searchers and they were actually looking for the people that they believed were in danger and screaming for help. According to his sister, one of the tires of his car was actually hanging partially off the cliff, which is extremely terrifying. Based on all the damage that they found on his vehicle, they assumed that he was driving up this 
terrain at a very high speed. His front bumper was completely off, his trunk was wide open, and the lock inside the trunk was either broken from the drive up or the tow it down. And his car ended up taking three tow trucks to get it completely down. At approximately 1.30 a.m., law enforcement heads to where Matthew's car is located. They then do a search with helicopters, infrared at night, and they dispatch canine units. These canine units tracked Matthew's scent onto the road and then lost his scent pretty much right after they started tracking it. His car was registered to his father, so authorities went to his father's door at around 5 a.m. and asked him what his car was doing there. He then told the police that he had given that car to Matthew Jr. to use. When he told police about that, they told him that near the car that morning there had been reports of cries for help and they asked him if he knew where Matthew was. That led to his father contacting Matthew's landlord who told him he hadn't seen him for the past few days. He then contacted his ex-wife and Matthew's stepmom, Brooke, who he was hoping Matthew was with, but she hadn't seen him either. Immediately, Brooke was concerned. She didn't feel like he would up and disappear like this. It was completely unlike him, and she said that he wouldn't let his siblings wonder if he was dead like this or not. He would at least let them know if he was okay, and at this point, if he is still alive, she believes that he is being held against his will. She reported him to the Lost Hills Sheriff's County Department, but then the case was transferred to LAPD's Missing Persons Unit. Since Matthew's disappearance, authorities and family friends have conducted so many searches, but they have turned up with no evidence. Even in his car, there is no proof of him being there. None of Matthew's personal items have been found, and that includes his car keys, his wallet, his cell phone, and his clothing. Luckily, Matthew's cell phone was still linked to his ex-girlfriend's account, so Brooke was able to access it right away. The last messages sent on his phone were the messages that I was referring to earlier. I will insert them on the screen here so you know what I'm talking about, just as a reference again. And his phone was either turned off or it died, but there has been no confirmation of which it was. Matthew's stepmother, Brooke, does not know the identity of the girl that he was last seen with, but law enforcement has cleared her of any involvement with this case. Now let's get into the theories of this case. The first theory is that his car broke down and he tried walking his way down and got stuck or hurt somewhere. This theory does make some sense, however, wouldn't it be likely that if he did get stuck or hurt somewhere, that they would have found him in these searches or some sort of DNA or physical physical evidence to prove what happened. None of this was found, and there's also no security footage showing him walking down the path that he came up, so that theory to me is highly unlikely. Some people think that he dropped the girl that he was partying with the night before off at her home and then went to go continue partying by himself. A few people think that maybe this party was actually happening at that canyon where they were, and that's why the gates were open. The people who don't believe that he went back to go party there believe that he went and partied elsewhere, and he he got in some sort of trouble. They think that someone locked him up in the back of his car and that's why the entire lock was broken. They took him up to this canyon and that's why his phone pinged him up there as well and they drove his vehicle so they couldn't be tracked. This is where they could have gotten rid of him but again it's likely they would have found him in searches. I don't really know how to explain this but maybe in this situation that's why he tried calling that girl and maybe his texts were so jumbled because he was panicked and rushed. However why would he be trying to call this girl and not his family or 911? It just doesn't make sense. The third theory is from the Malibu Canyon residents who believe that there could possibly be a serial killer on the loose. There has been an increase of violence in Malibu Canyon and there have been several people who have been shot or murdered in that area. This seems to make a lot of sense considering the hikers heard someone calling for help and saying that someone had a gun. But what doesn't make sense is why are these hikers hiking at one in the morning. None of this information is adding up and I'm very confused. If any of this information is incorrect, please correct me down below, but as far as I know, this is the most accurate information I could find. Also, according to the girl that he was with the night before, they partook in smoking weed and doing a little bit of cocaine. However, that shouldn't have made him too incoherent. He should have been able to still make rational decisions so people don't know what went on whatsoever. Matthew Weaver Jr. is described as being five foot nine 
29 and weighing about 140 pounds with brown hair and brown hazel eyes. If you have any information on Matthew's whereabouts or know what happened to Matthew in the early morning hours of August 10th of 2018 or happened to be in the Malibu Canyon around that time, make sure to call the Los Angeles Police Department Missing Persons Unit at 213-996-1800 and anyone who wishes to remain anonymous can call the Los Angeles Regional Crime Stoppers at 1-800-22-2-TIPS or go to lacrimestoppers.org. There is currently a $50,000 reward out for any information leading to him and I feel like someone probably knows something. This whole situation is just screaming foul play to me and I know I have a large audience in LA so I hope that we can share this video among people in LA and hopefully we can bring Matthew Weaver home safe to his family. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to turn on post notifications so you're notified when future true crime videos go live. I will hopefully see you guys on the next. I love you guys so much and hopefully I will see you on the next video. Bye.